Hello and welcome to lesson two of 20 in the URSA campus breakdown course on introductory statistics and probability. This is module one, introduction to statistics, part two, types of statistical data. Let's get started. When we're doing statistics, what we're basically doing is we're going to a population and we collect information from that population, which we call data. And the data that we can obtain from populations can take on many different forms. And that depends upon the type of population we're looking at, as well as the type of information that we are wanting to obtain from the population. So this lesson focuses on looking at all of the different types of statistical data that we might come across and categorizing them into different um, categories using a classification system based on key characteristics. The first way that we can classify statistical data is to split it into quantitative versus qualitative. So as the diagram shows on this slide, all data can be broken down into either quantitative or qualitative. Quantitative data is basically numbers, um, anything in numerical form, whereas qualitative data is non-numerical. So for example, uh, a list of people's surnames would be qualitative because it's made out of essentially uh, strings made out of letters is not numerical. Um, however, the same people in a population, their ages would be quantitative data because those are numerical values of how old they are. Another way that we classify data is into either discrete or continuous. We'll start with discrete data. Discrete data is defined as data that is countable. And what that means is that the possible values in the data set can be presented in a list form. The example we have here is a data set which is number of cars in households. So imagine that in a particular community, we are looking at each household and we are recording the number of cars owned by that household. Now, the minimum value would be zero cars. That would be for a household that does not own any car. And then the next possible value would be one, and then it would go on two, three, four, etc. Now, in this particular example, there is no upper limit per se, because while there may, say, be a world record uh, of how many cars have ever been owned by a single household. In theory, there's no specific particular upper limit to how many cars a household could own. So we would represent the list in this, in this form where it's not bounded on the right side. So we see the dot, dot, dot on the end of the list, on the right end, signifying that there's no upper limit. Now, what makes, <clears throat> whether, whether the list is bounded on either end or not, um, what makes a discrete data countable is that between any two values in the list of possible values, there are no further values possible. So for example, we couldn't have a household with 0 0.5 cars or 3.1 cars. We just are limited to the values in the list and, and we can therefore count them uh, one at a time. And that's why we call it discrete data countable. So on the other hand, we have continuous data, which is not countable. Continuous data represents ranges or continue continuums of values, which uh, cannot be presented in list form. An example we have here is rainfall uh, measurement in a rain gauge in millimeters uh, between zero and 300. So what this would be referring to is imagine a rain gauge that went as high as 300 millimeters because any rain gauge um, that that holds a quantity of water is going to have a an upper limit as to uh, how much rainfall can be recorded uh, 
And so we see that in this particular data set, the range of values is anywhere between 0 and 300, which is actually bo bounded on both ends. But interestingly enough, even though this particular data set is bounded on both ends, there's actually an infinite number of values for amount of rainfall or depth of rainfall. And that's because there's virtually, at least, an infinite number of values in between any two markings. For example, the, the rain gauge may mark individual millimeters, but say between uh, 10 and 11 millimeters, for example, there's actually an, a virtually infinite number of intermediate depths uh, because, as you can imagine, the, the amount of rainfall depth can go up by extremely small amounts, so small we're, we're, we would be talking on virtually the, the molecular level. Uh, which is technically not infinite uh, because there, there'll be some finite uh, depth that would be added by an extra molecule of water. But because that is so tiny, we think that is being virtually uh, infinite and, and limited only by the precision, the precision of the measuring device that we're using. Now, we looked previously at quantitative versus qualitative data. Let's now discuss how that fits in with this whole idea of discrete versus continuous data. So quantitative data can be either discrete or continuous. And uh, an example we can look at here uh, is um, if we're looking at the number of rainy days in a week, that would be a list of numbers between 0 and 7. So in this particular case, we would define any particular day as either being rainy or not rainy. And so in a week with 7 days, you could have as few as 0 rainy days, if it didn't rain at all, or as many as 7 rainy days, meaning that every single day had rain in it. So that would be a discrete uh, example of discrete quantitative data. However, if instead of looking at the number of rainy days in a week, if instead we actually measured the amount of rain that fell in the week, uh, that would be uh, a continuous range of numbers because as we mentioned in the previous slide, if you're looking at depth of rainfall, that's, uh, that, has, that has an infinite number of values between any two values. And that would be um, unlike the rain gauge that had an upper limit of 300. If we were actually looking at how much rain could fall, we would consider that as zero and upwards, uh, which would technically be theoretically be unbounded, although there's probably some upper limit as to how much rain can fall anywhere in a week. But at any rate, we would consider this to be continuous data. So here we have an example of discrete and continuous data sets that are both quantitative. Now, on the other hand, qualitative data, which is non-numerical, is always discrete because they're generally usually represented uh, with um, words or other sort of character strings. Example here would be a typical uh, dis um, qualitative uh, data set, which is discrete. Uh, would be responses to survey questions. So for example, you may have seen these types of uh, survey questions uh, where you'll have a set of questions and each one will offer you a number of choices uh, going from strongly agree to agree to neutral to disagree to st strongly disagree. Uh, there's not an infinite number of responses between any two responses in the list. And of course, if we pick two adjacent values like strongly agree and agree, there are, there are actually no values uh, in between those. So the important thing to remember here as the diagram at the bottom of the slide shows is that while quantitative data can be discrete or continuous, qualitative data is always discrete. The last uh, type of classification of data that we look at in this lesson is based upon how possible values in the data set are related to each other. And there are four general categories that we divide data types into in this respect. And going from sort of the lowest uh, 
form of data to the highest, we have a nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio data. And in the slides that follow, we will take a look at um, examples of these. But just to introduce them briefly, uh, the main characteristics of these uh, data, data types are as follows. Nominal data is data where values are not in a strictly defined order. And that's really why it's sort of considered the lowest form of data. Ordinal data is sort of a step up from nominal data. Uh, the, unlike nominal data, the values do have uh, an inherent order to them. However, the differences between values have no consistent value. And then the, the, the next two types of data, interval and ratio, are like ordinal data in the sense that they are, values are in strictly defined order. However, unlike ordinal data where the differences between values don't have a consistent value, in interval and ratio data, the differences between values do have a consistent meaning or a consistent value. Now, uh, the lower form of the two is interval data. Uh, and the, the thing that distinguishes interval data is that any value of zero in an interval data set does not mean none of something, whereas in ratio data, the value, any value of zero means none of whatever quantity it is that the, the data values represent. So now we'll take a look one by one at these four types of data and discuss what they actually mean. Uh, we'll start with nominal data. So the, 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 the distinguishing characteristic of nominal data sets are data sets where the values are in no, no particular single obvious order. So the, we'll look at some examples here. Uh, if you think of the four playing card suits in a, in a typical standard deck of cards, um, we see them listed here as clubs, diamonds, hearts, and spades. There isn't one sort of universal uh, order to those. Uh, in other words, there may be, for example, <clears throat> card games where there's an order to uh, some some suits worth, you know, uh, they're not all worth the same and there's the highest ranking suit and then it goes down to the, in, to the, to the lowest uh, from one to four. <clears throat> But because that may vary from game to game, and there isn't actually a, a one specific ordering of playing card suits, we would just think of playing card suits as being uh, just uh, four different values that are in no particular order. Similarly, if we have a list of geographic directions, and we know those to be typically north, south, east, and west, again, those are four values that don't necessarily have a universally accepted uh, ranking. Uh, um, um, amongst themselves. So we would consider that to be nominal data. Now you can even have numerical quantitative data um, that is nominal. An example here would be student ID numbers. Now it's very important to distinguish how we interpret the student ID numbers because since they are numbers and if, if you are a student um, in a university say you probably have something like a student ID number and so you could imagine that you could list student ID numbers in numerical order. In fact, it might be a logical way to, to, to classify them, say, if you were looking up students in a student directory or something like that. But in the sense that student ID numbers may either just be randomly assigned or assigned perhaps in the order of registration, which in a particular um, study may not be of, of, of much importance or any importance, so in that case, we would, we would say that the order is not very important. So even though the data is numerical, we would consider this to be nominal data. So to summarize, uh, nominal data can be either qualitative or quantitative, as the above exam examples show. But one thing that's really important about nominal data is that it can only be discrete. So you can't have continuous data. And, and as you can imagine, if there's no specific order to the different values, uh, it has to be discrete because you have to be able to list them. There couldn't be any intermediate values.
So we now go up a step to uh, ordinal data, which is the next highest form of data. So as mentioned before, the key characteristics of ordinal data is firstly that unlike nominal data, the values are in a strictly defined order. However, the other characteristic of ordinal data is that the differences between values don't have a consistent value. So let's discuss what that what that actually means. So we'll we'll use we'll look at a couple of examples of typical ordinal data sets. So we were talking before about survey question responses that are on a sort of scale. So we have an example here. You've probably seen questions like this. You may be asked about your attitude or opinion about something uh, in a question where the choices that you have are range from strongly agree down to strongly disagree. And there may be this example you see here has five. Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. You can clearly see that there's a there's an inherent ordering there. You wouldn't just jumble up those possible values in any order. You would rank them either from uh, you know most most disagreeing or strongly disagree to strongly agree or vice versa. You wouldn't just mix them up. So there is an inherent order. Uh, however, uh, two people there may be two people uh, one who uh, there may be two people say who both say that they strongly agree to a particular question. But does that mean that they actually have the exact same level of strong agreement? It's it's more of a group category. And so uh, there could be two people who both are listed as strongly agree, say, but their overall level of agreement may still not be exactly the same. Uh, put another way, uh, the um, the difference between someone who strongly agrees and someone who agrees or the difference between someone who disagrees and strongly disagrees or between agrees and new and is neutral may not always mean the same thing between two people with those particular responses uh, and and that's and that's what is meant by the differences between values not having a consistent value we can't really measure the difference between say uh, neutral and disagree or any two of those possible responses. Another example of ordinal data would be book uh, book bestseller list rankings. So this would be a list of, of the best selling books and they would be in the order say of, of the greatest sales. So that list may go you know one, two, three, four, two, whatever, however uh, many numbers of uh, places there are in the list. There's clearly a, an order to those values. But let's say that the bestseller list rankings are based on dollar sales of books, or maybe let's say the number of copies of books sold, even to keep it simpler. Uh, the, the difference between the number one book and the number two book on any given week may, may not be the same. So for example, in a particular week, the number one book may have only sold one more book than the number two book. But in a different week, the number one book might have sold hundreds or thousands of more copies than the number two book. And that's what's meant by the differences between values not being consistent. So between any successive values in these lists, we don't really have uh, a single consistent value that represents the difference between the two values. So to summarize, ordinal data, as we can see in the examples above, can be either qualitative or quantitative and can only be discrete, not continuous. So in that sense, ordinal data is, is um, very similar to nominal data. We next look at interval data, which is a step up in quality from ordinal data. Now, like ordinal data, interval data sets have values that are in a strictly defined order. However, Unlike ordinal data, where the differences between values don't have a consistent value, in interval data sets, the differences between values are consistent. Now, we'll look at ratio data after, and we'll see there's a difference between interval and ratio data. And that particular difference is that with respect to interval data, in an interval data set, a value of zero does not mean none of the quantity being measured.
So we'll look at a couple of examples here. Now one uh, would be east-west coordinates of points on a nautical chart or map. And the same, it, it would work the same way if we were looking at north-south coordinates as well. And the other example we'll look at are temperatures measured in degrees Celsius. Now in each of the above examples, the differences between values are consistent. So, for example, if one point has a, an east-west coordinate of west 5 kilometers and another point has an east-west coordinate of 4 kilometers, the distance in the east-west direction will always be 9 kilometers. So any two points with those east-west coordinates will always be separated in the east-west direction by 9 kilometers. Similarly, the difference between 15 degrees Celsius and 20 degrees Celsius is always 5 degrees Celsius. However, in, in both of these examples, a value of zero in the data set would not mean none of what's being measured. So for instance, if a point has an east-west coordinate of zero, it doesn't mean that there's no coordinate or that there's no location or that there's no point. It simply means that the point falls along a reference. In this case, it would be a reference line of longitude that separates uh, west from east. Now, under the system that you're perhaps most familiar with, this zero meridian runs through Greenwich in London, England. It's just arbitrarily selected to be the, the location where the zero meridian runs through. What that means is that, there, and there's plenty of other systems out there, and under those other systems, a point that has a, an east-west coordinate of zero under the uh, Greenwich, what they call the uh, Greenwich mean system, wouldn't have a zero value. It would have a value that was something west or something east. Uh, put another way, uh, you could have two points on a map, or you could have two points on the Earth, both of which have a zero east-west coordinate, but are actually not located in the same east-west position because their zero va values come from different scales. So one point might be zero on the uh, the Greenwich mean system, but another point where the where the zero meridian is being selected in a different location would have a zero, could have a zero value, but it is either east or west of the point that falls along the Greenwich mean zero meridian. Now, with temperature, zero degrees Celsius, we we should probably look first at temperature, the definition of the strict definition of what temperature is, is actually it's a measure of the amount of kinetic energy or heat energy. And zero degrees Celsius doesn't mean that there's no heat energy. Now it has been uh, pre-selected. Uh, it has been selected by the people who created the system of degrees Celsius to, to be the temperature at which under standard pressure, water will either freeze or melt depending on which direction it's going. So it, there is a specialness to zero degrees Celsius, but it doesn't mean that there's none of what's being measured, which strictly speaking is heat energy. Now you might be familiar with uh, the Fahrenheit scale, uh, which is another temperature scale. Uh, unlike Celsius, zero degrees Fahrenheit is actually in a different, at a different level of heat energy. It's actually uh, a, at a colder position than zero degrees Celsius. To sum up, interval data can only be quantitated. If you look at the, the discussion that we've just had uh, above regarding um, the, the nature of interval data. These are, these are characteristics that only quantitative data can have. So interval data is, cannot be qua qualitative, it can only be quantitative. However, interval data can be either discrete or continuous. Finally, we look at ratio data. Now ratio data is quite similar to interval data with one particular distinction. So the, the similarities are that the values are in a strictly defined order and that the differences between values have a consistent value. 
However, unlike interval data where zero doesn't mean none of, of what's being measured, in ratio data, zero means that there is none of what's being measured. So for example, we could look at the number of oil spills in a harbor in a given year. Uh, the, or we could be looking at temperature in degrees Kelvin. Now in both of these cases, zero does mean none. So for example, if we're measuring the number of oil spills and the number is zero, it means that there would be no oil spills. So that's none of the thing that we're observing or measuring. Temperature in Kelvin, in degrees Kelvin, is a special scale for temperature. Unlike Celsius or even Fahrenheit, which is another common uh, temperature scale, the Kelvin scale is, is a special scale for temperature where zero is defined um, theoretically as the point at which there is no heat energy. So whereas Celsius uh, measures temperature in it, an interval way, the Kelvin scale measures it in a ratio way, which is a higher form of data. So like uh, summing up, like interval data, ratio data can be quantitative only, only quantitative, no, no qualitative ratio data. And ratio data can be either discrete or continuous. So we close this lesson by looking at uh, a summary here, which is illustrated in the chart, showing the overall classification of data that we use in this course. And you can see from this diagram that all data can be classified as either quantitative or qualitative, so numerical or non-numerical. And while qualitative data can only be discrete, quantitative data can be discrete or continuous. And the, the qualitative data, which can only be discrete, can, can be further broken down into either nominal or ordinal data. Quantitative data, on the other hand, can be discrete or continuous. If it's discrete, it can be any of the four exam, uh, types of nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio data, whereas continuous data can only be interval or ratio. The following is a set of eight practice questions meant to offer a review of the material covered in this lesson. For each of the following data sets, we're asked to classify uh, into the three following ways, either first quantitative or qualitative, then discrete or continuous, and finally nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Question number one, we're looking at degree programs offered by a university. So first of all, degree programs in, in a university are non-numerical. They're essentially labels such as nursing, engineering, science, etc. And this is qualitative data. All qualitative data is discrete. And finally, there is no particular ordering of these programs. Now that can depend on uh, how you're actually looking at these programs. There may be uh, senses in which there is some order to them. But for the most part, we would just consider this a, a set of uh, programs of study or faculties and that sort of thing. And they're like labels. So uh, in that in that primary sense, we would consider this to be nominal data. So we have qualitative, discrete, and nominal. Question number two, we look at the number of rainy days in a year for different cities. So we're looking at a number, the number of rainy days. This is numerical and therefore quantita quantitative. Now, when we look at the number of rainy days, each time we look at a particular day in a particular city, it's either rainy or not. So the number of such days in a year, assuming we have 365 days in a year, unless it's a leap year, in which case there'd be 366 days. But in either, in either case, the number of such days would be between zero and either 365 or 366. 
So we're looking at values that we could definitely um, show in a list. So this is discrete data. And finally, uh, a value of zero for values in this data set would mean that there were no rainy days at all in the year. And so because zero here means none of what we're measuring, which is the number of rainy days, this is ratio data. So quantitative, discrete, and ratio. Question number three, we have times of day rounded to the nearest hour and based on the 24 hour clock. So times that are rounded to the nearest hour on a 24 hour clock system would be as follows. You, you could have uh, zero hours and zero minutes. The next possible value would be uh, one hour and zero minutes counting up. And that would go to two hours, zero minutes, et cetera, all the way up to 23 hours and zero minutes. Of course, once you get to 24 hours and zero minutes, you're actually back at zero, 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 which is the start of the next day. Uh, in any event, we definitely have quantitative data here. Now, as far as whether the data is discrete or, or continuous, this one is of particular interest. Time itself elapses continuously. And, however, in this case, it's very specific that this data consists of times of day that are rounded to the nearest hour. And this is a very important example uh, of, of something. This is an example of a very important type of decision that you need to make when you're considering the nature of data. While time is continuous, because we're rounding to the nearest hour, we are able to list the values as you can see in the answer for the first part and as previously mentioned here. So this is technically discrete data. And finally, a value of zero in this case uh, refers to a relative position in a day, as in midnight, the start of a day, the technical start of a day at, at uh, zero hours and zero minutes. It doesn't mean that there's no hour or no time. So it's just a, re it's just a reference to a particular time of day and therefore that makes this interval data and not ratio data. So we have quantitative, discrete, and interval. Question number four, we have rankings of students based on academic performance. These rankings are positive integer number values starting at one and going through two, three, et cetera, all the way up to the class size, therefore quantitative data. They are positive integer values only, and they don't include values in between these numbers. So there's no possible values in between the integer values one, two, et cetera. Therefore, this is uh, we could we could make we could list these values in a list, and therefore this is discrete data. And the rankings are integer values, and therefore have a strictly defined order. However, the differences between these values do not have a consistent value. In other words, say we were measuring to determine the rankings, we were using some sort of a scale like a like a GPA, a grade point average. The difference in the GPA between any two particular rankings, say between the number one and number two students, does not always have the same value. It, the, the two consecutive students could be very close, but they could also be farther apart. And for this reason, that we don't have a consistent difference between particular values, this is ordinal data. So quantitative, discrete, and ordinal. Number five, we have difficulty ratings for hiking trails. Easy, moderate, difficult, and extremely difficult. These difficulty ratings are non-numerical, they're labels, so this is qualitative data. And all such data, all qualitative data is discrete. And there is a definite order to these ratings, ranging from easy, through moderate difficult to extremely difficult. However, since these values don't have a consistent value, these, since these are qualitative values, 
there's no consistent value to the differences. We don't have a sort of a scale that we can use here. So as is the case with qualitative discrete data that has an order to it, it's limited to being just ordinal data. And therefore, we have qualitative, discrete, and ordinal. Number six, we have randomly assigned eight-digit student ID numbers. Now, these are numerical values, strictly speaking, so we call this quantitative data. And these are round values that we could certainly uh, show in a list with no intermediate values between these, these, these whole number um, student numbers. So this is discrete data. And finally, while these ID numbers do have an inherent order to them, since they're numbers and all numbers do by definition, they're randomly assigned to students. It's not like, for example, they're assigned in some sort of chronolo chronological order of student registration. Because they're just assigned randomly, and this is an important point here, an important distinction, we would say that the ordering of these numbers has no relevant, no relevant, no relevance, no relevant meaning. Therefore, we would best classify this as nominal data. So therefore, quantitative, discrete, and nominal. Number seven, latitude coordinates for, a ge for geographic locations in degrees north or south. Now these are numerical values that range between 90 degrees north, if you're at the North Pole, and 90 degrees south at the South Pole. So this is quantitative data. And as you move from pole to pole in either direction, uh, you're continuously changing your value. So latitude coordinates are therefore continuous. And finally, they're, they're ordered. There's an obvious ordering here. We have a numerical scale. So from 90 degrees north to 90 degrees south or vice versa. Zero here represents the middle value. Uh, it's, it's essentially means that you're somewhere along the Earth's equator when your latitude is zero degrees. It doesn't represent that there's no latitude coordinate or that you're nowhere. It simply indicates that you're sitting at a boundary location between the, the north and south. In fact, the northern, essentially what we call the uh, northern and southern hemispheres. So therefore, this is not ratio data, it's interval data. So we have quantitative, continuous, and interval. And finally, we have number eight, heights of trees in a forest in meters. Tree heights are measured with numbers, numerical values. This is quantitative data. Now, tree growth occurs gradually over time. And for that reason, by definition, this would be continuous data. Even though the measurements that we might make with a particular instrument would generally need to be rounded to the level of precision of the instrument, that would make it discrete if we were looking at the rounded values. But strictly speaking, the actual tree height at any time would, con would be considered to be continuous data because of this um, gradual growth over time. And finally, tree heights are values where zero would mean there's no height. Now, any tree would have some height. So um, it's, it's kind of obvious if you think about it that there would be no tree that had a height of zero exactly because then there's nothing there. Um, however, what decides whether, whether a, va a variable is ratio or not is simply based on whether a value of zero, basically on what it would mean. And in this case, when you're measuring height, a zero value literally means there's no height. So by that definition, this is ratio data. So we have quantitative, continuous, and ratio. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from MRSA Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.